Marcus, you're not a team player. That is groupthink because that is direct pressure on you because you've clearly said something, you've considered something, you've done something that has made somebody feel, you know, challenged. And instead of challenging you properly on that and having good discourse and debate, they use those sort of phrases. Welcome to The Thinking Leader, brought to you by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, you'll get new ideas and insights from business executives, military experts, and innovative thought leaders to help you lead more effectively and better navigate your complex world. Now, here are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker, Bryce Hoffman, and former RAF Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach, Marcus Dimbleby. Welcome to another episode of The Thinking Leader. Marcus Dimbleby, my partner in crime, what do you want to talk about today? So, Bryce, uh, we've been getting a few questions from our listeners about something that I really want to talk about. And I think we should talk about groupthink. Groupthink. I think we should talk about groupthink too. Oh, there we are. We're already, we're falling victim to groupthink here. What I should have done was was push back and question your assumptions about whether we should talk about groupthink. You should have. No, I do think, I do think it's a good idea to talk about groupthink. Yeah. It, it is one of the, the main threats to good decision-making that Red Team Thinking is designed to counter and overcome. Definitely. So and it, it's something I think everybody sees. I mean, I, I've not seen an organization, have you, that that hasn't fallen victim to groupthink. Was there groupthink in the RAF? There was, without a doubt. I think wherever you get a sort of tribal behavior, groupthink is a natural outcome of that, which you have to guard against. I seen, you know, when I was working in the big banks, you see it there. And Nobody is immune to it. Even small organizations, small groups, small businesses. As you become more aligned, groupthink is one of those things that naturally becomes a default behavior. And it's something that you very much become unaware of as it's happening around you. And Absolutely. Only, and only when you start to see the outcomes of it or people from the external viewpoint recognize it, that people see it for what it really is. And it's, as you said, it's very dangerous to have that in your business. It, 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 it is. And it's, it's even when you're aware of it, it doesn't, it doesn't go away. You have to, it's like, it's, it's, it's like a, a dust. If you don't constantly work to keep it at bay, yeah, it will take over your, your, your house. And, you know, I, this, this was driven home to me so powerfully. One of our first big clients, as you know, was, was Verizon. And um, when I was a kid, my mother, used to be a, an executive with uh, the phone company, as we used to call it back then when it was just the phone company in the United States, the Monopoly, Ma Bell, AT&T, the old AT&T. Yeah. And I remember she went to, you know, a, a, a several day training workshop at corporate headquarters in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. And she came back with a big, big binder that said groupthink on the side of it. And she told me that that's what, the, you know, that's what the training had been about was being aware of how groupthink impacts the decision-making of the corporation and, and what executives need to do to combat it in their teams. So that was in probably 1982. So wow. in 2000 and I want to say 2017, I was at, Verizon's headquarters, which was the old AT&T headquarters <laughs> All that years later. in Basking Ridge, leading a workshop on overcoming groupthink. And wow. I said to, to, to people, don't think just because you're aware of this that you've dealt with the problem because <laughs> my, my mom went to a workshop just like this at, went in your previous, because Verizon was one of the companies that split off of, of yeah. the old AT&T. And uh, I said... You know, here we are 40 years later having this a, a workshop on the same topic because this never goes away. I don't know. It's crazy. Isn't it? And it's been around since, what was it, 1971, wasn't it, when Irving Janis coined the phrase I think, in Psychology Today magazine. And it's just one of those things that's snowballed and become more and more popular in business school. But, you know, it's still there. As you said, it doesn't go away. So actually, Marcus, you know, I mean, Janice is the one who is credited with with 
writing about and, and, and making people aware of this concept of groupthink as such. But it goes back a lot farther. In fact, William White, back in 1952, wrote a piece in Fortune magazine talking That's about... True group think impacting business decision making and he and he was he was using it in reference to to George Orwell's 1984 mm-hmm. but i really think the roots of our understanding of groupthink go back to solomon ash's experiments in which began in 1951 and and i will tell you folks if you are not familiar with solomon ash's experiments uh this is something that will keep you up at night Ash is A-S-C-H. You can look this up on, on the internet. We'll put a link in the, in the show yeah, notes. Awesome. But what Ash did, he was a, he was a college professor, and he conducted a, a series of experiments into how people think or don't think, as the case may be, in group settings. And the way that he, his first set of experiments, he got a group of 11 uh, theater majors, acting students together to play the role of participants in a study of human perception. And then he got one actual subject, the 12th person, who was actually the subject of the experiment but didn't know it, to participate in what they told were told was a study of human perception. And then Ash created a series of, of, of cards, and we'll put an image in the show notes or maybe our producer Sam could put one on screen right now. But these cards would have a, a line drawn on them, say a, a four-inch line on one card, and then the other card would have three lines. One is identical to the line on the other card. Mm-hmm. The others are wildly different. So if it was a four-inch line on one card, the other card would have one line that was an inch long and a line that was four inches long and a line that was six inches long. So in the, you know, in the controls for this, Ash, as Ash put it, you had to either be physically or mentally impaired not to be able to get the right answer every single time. It wasn't, there was no wiggle room. There was no need to squint. It was glaringly obvious which of the three lines on the one card matched the line on the other card. But this wasn't a test of human perception. It was a test of how people think in group settings. And so what he did was he would have 10 rounds of cards and a different person would speak first each time, but it would always be one of the actors. It would never be the subject. And the first couple of cards, they would give the right answer. But starting on the third or the fourth card, the actors would start to give the wrong answer. And and then whoever spoke first would say it's, you know, it's line three on the second card when it was clearly line one. Yeah. And everyone else would nod and say, yes, you know, as they went around the room and they always made it so that the, the subject was in the middle of the group or at the end of the group. And, but not every single time, but in each session of, you know, doing this a dozen times or 10 times, whatever it was, at least once and often a lot more than once the actual subject would give the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. It was demonstrably wrong yeah, because they were falling victim to what would later be called groupthink. But the thing that's most troubling isn't that. The thing that's most troubling is that when Ash and his his fellow researchers would interview them afterwards, most people, when, when they were asked, why did you give the wrong answer when it was so obviously wrong, didn't know they'd given the wrong answer. Is that ingrained into conformity? Yeah. And that's what, and that's what he well called, by the way, was his, he he was studying the effects of conformity. And this was across age. It was across education level. It was across IQ. Even people who were really smart would get worn down. They would start to doubt themselves Mm -hmm. and they would ultimately start to go along with the group. Now that right there is to me, one of the most terrifying scientific studies that's ever been done. And it, and it all ties in, doesn't it, with this, as you said there, even smart people fought for this. And this really ties into the social conformity that we as humans want to be part of. We want to conform. We want to be part of a gang, a tribe, a group. You start that in kindergarten as kids. You just want to hang out with the cool guys. And then when you get in that group, and, and I've seen this in business, I've seen it in the military. You know, you said about in the military, do we have this in the Air Force? 
in the Air Force, you've got your groups, you've got your pilots who have disdain about everyone else. And then you've got your admin group who are, you know, doing their own thing and you've got your fighter controllers. And it's the same in the army. Each regiment has its own perspective and each regiment itself has its own group think and thinks it's better and thinks it's right compared to everyone else. And it's that social conformity and that desire to be like everyone else that creates this group think, this conformity that is very dangerous when it goes into the challenge aspects of what we should be doing and thinking differently. So, so how do we look at, A, how do we identify this in organizations? And well, then how can we start you know, countering it? Well, let's start with, with how you identify it. And, and just to, before we get into that, just to, on what you said about what you saw in the military, I mean, it's worth noting that Irving Janus did his, his pioneering work on groupthink by studying the Bay of Pigs fiasco yeah. in the United States and seeing how, how a military plan that was ill-conceived from the start and that, that objectively senior military folks had said had little, if any, chance of succeeding ended up becoming something that people were wildly enthusiastic about and everybody was convinced was going to be the most brilliant military, uh, you know, exploit in, in, in modern history. And it was all, it wasn't because they were, you know, dismissing consciously, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the contravening evidence. It was just the more they talked about it, the more they came to, to, to believe it. And the more they created an echo chamber in the oval office around Kennedy, yeah. where everybody was just kind of starting to nod their heads in agreement. And it, and this is different than the Abilene paradox, which is another pathology of decision-making, which is where people know they're giving the wrong answer, but they, they go ahead and do it anyways because they don't want to rock the boat or they don't, you know, just inertia. Groupthink is, a, is subconscious. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just this, it, it, it starts to wear people down. And that's what happened in, in the White House in the early 1960s, which led to this complete fiasco. But Janice identified eight symptoms of groupthink. And, and, you know, if you talk about how do you identify them in the organization, let's just go through them. And then, you know, I think most people will, will find many of these frighteningly familiar. So the first one is illusions of invulnerability. Ooh. And that's where you start to think that, like, we're too big to fail or, you know, yeah. we, we can't miss you know, that sort of thing. You start to to exaggerate the group's ability to succeed. Definitely. Definitely. It's that overly optimistic behavior you see, isn't it? You see you see this forming as a group. You see where groups come to and it's it's almost an antonym to what good teamwork is because we, we look at creating high performing teams, but then very quickly the outcome of that high performing team is that invulnerability, which is a kind of ego power driven yeah. thing which is a good thing but then the counter to that is it's a bad thing and you see the behaviors that don't warrant the behavior we we should be seeing in quality teams because it takes and again you said it's it's unconscious and that's what right. makes it so dangerous it is and i mean i saw this all the time <clears throat> when i covered the automobile industry so I remember one of the best examples of this was uh, when when GM General Motors was working on the development of the what, the car that would become the Chevy Volt, and they'd unveiled a prototype of this car at the Detroit Auto Show, and said it was going to be ready in a year or something like that. And the next year they had another version of the prototype, but still no car. And this was going on endlessly. They kept they kept promising it was almost here, and in the midst of this. I had I had dinner with the president of one of the the suppliers that was providing the chemicals for the battery in the car. And the battery was the big holdup at this point. This was going to be one of this was you know back when Teslas were still being handmade, you know, and stuff. This was in the early days of the EV market, and so batteries were the hang up. And and this guy told me, I can't believe GM is telling you guys that this is going to launch next spring. He says we haven't even figured out the battery chemistry yet. And, and they can't develop the battery until the battery chemistry is figured out. And, you know, that's going to take a year and all this stuff. So I, 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 I confronted one of the senior executives at GM the next week about this. And I told him, I said, you know, I, I talked with somebody who is intimately familiar with, with the production and the development of your battery, who says that the battery chemistry isn't even figured out yet. So how could you possibly launch this car next spring? And he, and I'll never forget it. He leaned forward and he looked at me and he said, I'll tell you why, Bryce. 
because we're General Motors. Uh, and if we say fun. it will be done, it will get done. Oh, spoiler alert, it didn't get done. Funny but that's thing. that's illusions of invulnerability right yeah. there. That's a great one. That's a great one. So number two is belief in the inherent morality of the group. We are the good guys. We are the smart guys. We are the, the, the brilliant innovators and our opponents, our adversaries are idiots. They're stupid. They're evil. They're wrong. Exactly what I was talking about earlier, isn't it? It's that stereotyping of anybody outside of your clan, your crowd, your tribe. And therefore, you're not open to opinions from anybody outside of that circle, which, again, is very dangerous because you all become that self-blowing trumpet internally. And somebody says one thing and everybody agrees with it because that's what they believe. You know, if they're right, then we must all be right. And then when the outsider who is perceived as that outsider, stereotypically normally, whatever they say, as long as it you know, doesn't align with you, they're going to ignore it or they're going to dismiss it because, as you said, they're invulnerable and anybody else is an idiot. And, and that's a very frequent thing you sadly come across in many organizations that, that focus on creating these small teams, which ultimately turn into one of those monsters. So number three is rationalizing or the tendency to explain away contradictory or disconfirming evidence or data. Yeah. So we see this again all the time. And by the way, this is something that came out in the Challenger uh, disaster investigation when the challenge, a space shuttle Challenger blew up and they were looking into how it happened. And there was all sorts of red flags about the, mm-hmm. the, the weakness of the O-rings on the rockets and particularly in cold weather and stuff. But it was all brushed aside because the, the, the powers that be had decided it wasn't an issue. Yeah. And, and it, was, it was willfully ignored. Willful and, blindness. We talk about that in the classes, don't we? Which is now no longer going to get you out of court. If you are seen to be acting upon, you know, with willful blindness, that doesn't stand up anymore. And I think <clears throat> we all know, you know, we love the pre-mortem. Every single post-mortem that's been done, the chain of events that are revealed that led up to that final incident there were numerous links in that chain. And each one of those links, one of those warning signs. But as you said, they get rationalized out. As people surface them, the red flag gets surfaced. Somebody on the counter side rationalizes why that's no longer a risk or why that's not a threat and we should dismiss that. And when Absolutely. you get the group link doing that, all of those chain, links in the chain get ignored until finally, as we said, with Challenger and many, many other incidents we've seen. Right here, it, you know, as we're recording this in the past few weeks in the United States, we've had a couple of, of serious rail, rail derailments, and, yeah. and most notably this one in Ohio. And it's come to light afterwards that uh, some of the, the switching yard workers, I was listening to a woman who worked in, in one of the yards that serviced this train that derailed, was talking about how she, she came to her foreman and saying, you know, look, I, these, these wheel bearings are leaking on all these cars and stuff and was told, ah, you know, that's just grime, you know, just br- brush it off and stuff. And that's what caused the, the the derailment. So you get this, you get this scenario where people just, just explain away stuff they don't want to deal with. Yeah. And it's funny. We're not rational thinkers, but we're rationalizing group think. Which is quite <laughs> exactly. Bizarre. So number four is, uh, is, uh, uh, well, number four is the, is the converse to, to number two. If, if we're the good guys, number four is stereotyping, that we portray the other guys as stupid or evil or inept. Yeah. Just, yeah. Unprofessional behavior, but it becomes that accepted norm. And you hear this all the time. I've done, you know, I've done a lot of coaching across different teams. And I was in one organization where I was coaching nine different teams. And it just I just sat there quietly observing and listening the things they were saying about other teams. And, right. you know, and, and the, what's when it's normally just said in, with a truth often, that's the first stumbling block because then they just start saying smack about anybody and everybody that's not in that group. And you can see it grow over time. And if you don't interject and just call them out, and I, I left it for about three weeks till I had the evidence. And I just said, you should listen to yourselves. And they're like, what? And I read out. I said, these are the things you have said. And 90% of those are not relevant to the work we're discussing here, the dependencies we've got with those teams. It's just downright nastiness and bitchiness. And you don't even realize, and they were, they, as you said earlier, they were shocked. They weren't aware they were doing it. 
But one person slipped it out and then another one did and they jump on that bandwagon and it all becomes a normal behavior that's accepted, which is the necessity of groupthink, as we know. Absolutely. So then you get, then you get, uh, what are we on? Number five is self-censorship, where now the power of the group think is so strong that people who do have doubts yeah. just, just start not sharing them. Yeah, because they know what's going to happen. Yeah. They, they, they've seen it happen before. They're going to get shut down. They see what happens to others. And now you're in the inner circle. You don't want to be that person dissenting because before you know it, oh, no. you're going to get shut down. Or do you know what? Step outside the circle. You're not part of the clan anymore. Exactly. Huge. And that leads to number six. Yeah. Which is illusion. I love how Janice puts this illusions of unanimity. Wow. That is mistaking silence for consent. Unanimous consent because you've got a room for nobody else not speaking. spoke up. Yeah. And it's it's funny, we talk about echo chambers where you get the yes men, where there's illusions of unanimity. People don't normally say a thing. You know, if people aren't agreeing, but they're not disagreeing, then they are disagreeing quietly. And that's something that, you know, if you're, lead, if you're listening as a leader and manager out there and you're making statements, making comments, and you're not getting, you know, nodding heads, but you're not getting challenged either, they're probably fearful of challenging for many reasons and groupthink could be one of them. And then you get number seven, which is to me one of the most dangerous ones, which is what Janice calls mind guards, self-appointed thought police, as he describes. No one's told them this is their job. But they, when somebody speaks up in a meeting and says, you know, hey, folks, have we thought about this? They're the ones that will take them aside during the break and say, you know, Jim, probably not the wisest career move to raise that question right now. Yeah. You might want to rethink that, you know. Yeah. Um, or, you know, Jill, I, I, I think you, you risk looking stupid if you come back in and keep making that point. Yeah. And that then shuts down the healthy pushback, the constructive debate, the exactly. constructive challenge yeah. in organizations. And that's what we need. The, those mind guards, as you said, it's, and you see that a lot in the military. You know, is the senior officer looking at the junior officer saying, you know, given the fact the rank you're at, you shouldn't be thinking and saying those things, young man. You may want to pipe down. Yep. And then you think, okay, I don't want to get my promotion stopped, so I'll be quiet for another five years. Or And you see it constantly all the time. It's almost that, you know, parenting mode to children isn't it you know, be, be seen but not heard and it's, it's awful absolutely awful and you can see how that stops people engaging and it brings that stress that we're seeing now and that discomfort in the workplace and then ultimately it leads to, to the final symptom of group think that janice uh identified number eight conformity which is what he says is is when you reach the point where dissent is viewed openly as disloyal yeah so now it's not someone taking you aside during a break and telling you that it's somebody telling you in the meeting, you are part of the problem because you're questioning us. And when you reach that point in your organization, yeah. Oh, you it's, it's, and it's you know, it's interesting. Question. You, you see this, I, I was just reading an analysis in foreign affairs of, of how Russia invasion of Ukraine was, was such a colossal debacle. And the thing that was fascinating about it, Marcus, that I hadn't thought about is, is that authors point out that Russia broke every principle of its own written military doctrine when it, in, in, the, in, the, in the invasion of Ukraine. Like, for instance, their written doctrine is that you don't invade a country until you pound it for yeah. one to two weeks with missiles and airstrikes. You don't launch ground operations until you have air supremacy, all these things like this. You yeah. concentrate the main force one. into one one axis of attack rather than splitting it up into multiple axes as they did. Yeah. And what they said is the reason this was able to happen, the reason they were able to launch this, this ill-conceived, forget about evil, but ill-conceived invasion, despite the fact that it contravened everything in Russia's military doctrine, is because every time a general tried to point that out, they were told they were being disloyal. They were told that they were a Western puppet. They were told that they weren't loyal to, to, to Vladimir Putin. And it ended up being Putin, a couple of his civilian cronies, and a couple of, of you know, bootlicking uh, generals yeah. who, who saw an opportunity to get promoted in the Kremlin, making all these ill-conceived plans Kremlin. and absolutely not just ignoring, but threatening anyone who dared to challenge them. 
And the result was one of the biggest military debacles in, in, in recent history. We see that all the time. If you're, again, if you're on a team and you're hearing phrases like, Marcus, you're not a team player. That is groupthink because that is direct pressure on you because you've clearly said something, you've considered something, you've done something that has made somebody feel, you know, challenged. And instead of challenging you properly on that and having good discourse and debate, they use those sort of phrases where, you know, you might want to stay in your lane. You know, the bell curve and the promotions are coming up end of the year. You know, the performance, yeah, we've all heard them. And that is that subtle bullying, isn't it, that is a standard of groupthink trait. So it's something to really consider and, again, go through these eight things. And if you're witnessing them, do something about it. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk about what you can do about it. Spoiler alert, it involves red team thinking. Stay tuned. Hey folks, Bryce here. If you're listening to this and you're liking what you're hearing and you're wondering, am I a red team thinker? We have an easy way for you to find out. Just go to the show notes, click on the link there to our free assessment to find out if you are a red team thinker and what you can do to think more effectively, to lead more effectively, and to make better decisions faster in your complex world. Like I said, the link is in the show notes, or you can simply go to our website, redteamthinking.com. Check it out. I can't wait to see how you score. Welcome back. So during the break, I was I was looking at my notes on, on uh, Ash's experiment, and I found that 75% of his subjects got the chose the wrong answer at least once, which is really a troubling figure. Now it is worth noting. I don't, I haven't seen this research, but somebody told me that, that a team of psychologists recently reconducted Ash's experiments and found that the number was significantly lower now because their, their theory is that people have become a lot more willing to, to push back and question today than they were in 19 early 1950s, mm -hmm. but that it was still a troublingly high number. But before we went on break, we were talking about what can you do about it? Exactly. And here's the thing is there's another ask, there's another part, there's a part two to Ash's experiments. I hope it's better than the first one. It is <laughs> much horrible. better. It's much better. After I, after I read the first part of Ash's experiments, I, I wasn't sure <laughs> whether I wanted to keep going, <laughs> but part two is, is much better. So after Ash had, had spent a couple of years uh, proving just how, terrifyingly sheep-like we could be, he then changed up his experiment. And he had one of, everything was the same. The real subject never got to go first. But the change was this. He now started having one of the other, one of the actors, not the first one who went, but someone else in between, mm -hmm. give not the right answer, but the other wrong answer. So now instead of everybody saying the same thing before the actual subject got to speak, ah, somebody said something else. The opposite. And guess what happened? Almost a hundred percent of people got the right answer again. Yeah. And, it, and it wasn't hearing the right answer. It was, as he put it, it was hearing that it was okay to not think like the group. Yeah. It's not going to be just me who says the, the right wrong answer because someone right. else said something different. So right now there's two different answers. So whatever I say, I'm okay. Goes back to and, that way we think. It's crazy. And and he he called it that that what you need, he concluded, to avoid this in an organization was what he called a lone dissenting voice was sufficient. Mm -hmm. That if you had one person in the organization and the team, whatever, yeah. who was challenging the conclusions. That was enough to give everyone else in the organization permission to think for themselves again. And that gets into what, you know, Kahneman talks about, protect your dissenters. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great line of his. It's a great line. And again, if you've got that lone dissenting voice, that person will obviously be fearful, but there's ways you can do it, isn't there? I call it the lost art of contradiction. How do we disagree agreeably? How are we professionally provocative without winding people up? We've joked about this before and, and you're the same as me in our younger days. <laughs> we've all had the right intent, but the way we've delivered that message, hand on my heart, has probably been in a 
an unreceivable way by the individual directing the message out, I guess. And I think it's having those techniques, having that understanding of how, A, how you can deliver a message better, but also understanding the recipient, understanding the biases, their perspective, you know, telling somebody's plan that it's going to suck and fail. If that's their baby that they've been crafting for 18 months, that's not going to be taken well. So you can tell them it's going to fail, but in a very roundabout, more subtle way by using some tools and techniques but yeah red team thinking well that's what you say that when i was when i was going through the u.s army's red team leader course i think i was about two weeks into the three-month course when uh i i said in class wow i thought i was just an asshole all my life and now i learned that i'm a red teamer <laughs> and, and the thing is though is is that is that that my instructor colonel benson uh said well you could, you know, if if you're not doing it as you say in a constructive and collegial right. way, that's then the you're thing. still just an asshole. <laughs> you're yeah. not. And that's the thing, you know, it's so important for people to understand. And we spend so much time teaching this in our courses, yeah. and and teaching this to the companies and other organizations that we work with, which is that you have to learn how to disagree agreeably, as you said, how to be a constructive contrarian, mm-hmm. and how to approach this challenge function in a collegial way. Absolutely. And and that's what it really comes down to is it's about it's about helping make the plan better, not showing everyone else that you're smarter than they are and that you're the one with the brilliant idea. Exactly. And that's why the, the first problem. red team, the first army red team, we've talked about this in the past. We can put a link to the episode. I don't remember what we <clears> talked about. It was a complete failure because they were arrogant. Yeah. There isn't that, there's that hero status that you adopt because you, you're part of that high performing team with a perceived super skill. And that's a natural default. But I think it's really important that we help people understand this because what what (laughs) I love about our group and our community, the the insurgents, we call them, they come along and just like you saying what you said at the the schoolhouse, they come along and go, oh, I found my people. I found someone. And I got a lovely email. We did a, a masterclass last night and Marcella messaged me today. And she said, quote, I so love feeling comfortable feeling uncomfortable. Oh, I love that. that don't Marcella. This is the second time we've mentioned Marcella on a podcast. This is one of our great red team insurgents who's in Mexico. Yeah. yeah. And she comes along and she's just so enthusiastic, but she gets it. Like last night, she just sat taking it all in like a sponge again. And I just thought that's such a powerful thing. You know, how many people in the world, in the workplace, in our families, how many people are comfortable feeling uncomfortable? And when I say you're feeling uncomfortable, when you hear something that's not right, it makes you feel uncomfortable. And if you're not comfortable feeling that, you're not going to be in a position to be confident to respond, to counter, to challenge and have a good conversation and discourse about that. And I think it's really powerful that if you can get comfortable with that uncomfort that we have now in this VUCA complex world we're in, it's a really game changing capability that we can all really bring on board, I think. Well, it's essential. I mean, you know, if you want to succeed, if you want to to successfully navigate this complex world that we all live in today, you have to become comfortable with ambiguity. You have yeah. to become okay with not having a black or white answer. You have to you have to you have to be adept at operating in the gray zone. And that's what's required in business, in government, in the military, in the intelligence community. Every Everything that we work with, every 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 group that we work with, requires that be, ability to become comfortable with ambiguity. And if you think about it, Marcus, what is groupthink but being scared of ambiguity? That's Absolutely. why people are like this. If you go back to Ash's experiments, why did people go along with the wrong answer? Because they were uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Absolutely. Being the, the only one raising their hand saying, wait a minute, people, can't you not, do you not have eyes to see that the answer you've given is, is, I mean, look at these two cards. There's no, there's no ambiguity here. It's crystal clear. They're uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable. They don't want to stand out. I know. And again, in this, in this VUCA world that we're in, there is ambiguity and you see all the time, people don't like ambiguity. So they try and make it clear. They want to move out the gray zone to black or white, whether the answer is false or not, they don't care. They're comfortable when they have an answer, even if it's the wrong answer. So they'll focus getting an answer, convince everybody that's the good answer. They've satisfied quickly to get there. 
and they've not realized that they're still in the gray and it's okay to be in the gray. We talk about complexity, just accept you're in complexity. And that means you have to experiment. You have to test and learn and iterate and then apply. And if you're switching between black and white, not appreciating you're in the gray, then I think what you're doing is missing the other opportunities. So even when there is an answer that you all agree on, pause, and this is one of the techniques you can use, and go, what if the opposite's true? Yep. What if that's completely the wrong answer? And just put that out there purposely yep. and let people know you want a different perspective. And that yep. will allow people to go, do you know what? Hang on a minute. And they'll think absolutely different things. And what surfaces, even if it might not dissuade your answer, it may bolster your answer and provide you with more evidence to, to support it. That's a technique that we call on the contrary. And it's very powerful. Cool. And it, it's based on the, the way that the Israelis approach red teaming, which is in a very informal way. You know, when we worked with it with our colleague, Itai Shapira, we got to have Itai on the show. We've never had Itai on the show. Yeah. We got to have Itai on the show. I'm making a note of that right now. Um, you know, when we were, when we were sharing all of our really cool tools and techniques with Itai, his reaction was kind of like, that's, that's fine for you Americans. You know, he says, we just, in Israel, we just, uh, you know, tell people that we, disagree violently with everything they said and you know push yeah. back and and we're not we're not polite about it and that's uh, the name of their red team isn't it ipsha mistabra on the contrary the opposite may be true yeah i know Absolutely. i'm butchering the aramaic but but listen to that just listen to that phrase isn't it isn't that far better than bryce you're an asshole that's a wrong answer yeah Bryce. on the contrary the opposite could be true but that's not how they do it. They do it the formal way. Of course they don't. I know they do it the first way. <laughs> and this is, by the way, too, this is Kahneman told me the same thing when I was working on my book and I and I was was, was running this all by Daniel Kahneman. He said, well, you know, Bryce, I, I think this works great in places like Israel. I'm not so sure if it works as well in places like the United States and <laughs> the United Southwest. Kingdom. Yeah. He says the same thing. He said, You're, you, people are too polite here. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. I disagree. I think, you know, it's what we were talking about. You can You can disagree agreeably. Absolutely. People used to be able to do this. This is, this is uh, now I'm going to go off on a tangent, but, you, but I can't help it. You know where I'm going. This is what is wrong with our societies today. Yeah. Because we've lost the ability to, to disagree with each other without dehumanizing each other. You know, in this country, back in, back in the 1980s, famously, you know, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, who was our Speaker of the House at the time, leader of the Democrats in, in, in Congress, were... were opposed to each other on on pretty much every single issue and yet they met every friday for a beer and talked about how they could find common ground and work together and it didn't mean either of them stepped back from what they believed it's just they they saw each other not as enemies but as people who thought differently from each other and as a result you know and, and this is why i get so upset by all these people who try to claim the mantle of ronald reagan today and, and are totally you know ideologues who are unwilling to, to even consider, mm -hmm. co you know, compromises, he compromised all the time. That's how he got all these things done. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and we've lost the ability to do that. Now, it, it, if you're not with us, then you're the enemy. That's it. And it's this polarization, isn't it, of society on Twitter, on social media. And it's not even, we're talking about, we did assumptions challenge last night, and we're talking about facts versus assumptions and, and opinions. You know, I'm sorry, if a fact is a fact, and it's a fact, your opinion doesn't sway or change the fact it's a fact. But this right. is the thing, you've got people arguing that black is white, and white is black, and vice versa. And, you know, the sky is not blue. Well, it doesn't matter what planet you're on. You know, we say it's blue, it's blue. And people are going to, but my opinion is it's a different color. Well, that's okay, that's, that's okay. That's your opinion. Right, but you can't counter it in such a vehement way, which is what we're seeing in society, and then that comes into the workplace, and people therefore don't want to step out for fear of that repercussion. And opinions, as you said, are not facts. That's the thing that you know. I, I can't believe we have to explain this in our classes, but we do now. Didn't I know, used to. I know. I'm to your, my grandma used to say, "Opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I was having this conversation, you know, a few months ago in a class that we were doing and, 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 and someone said in the class when I was explaining the difference between facts and assumptions that, well, but my truth may be different than your truth. And, and I said, I said, that, seriously, I said, it's not truth. It, it's Correct. an opinion. Your opinion yeah. might be different than my opinion, 
But the truth is the truth. There is an objective right. reality out there that's outside you or me. You know, it. it you know, it, it, it's not. And that's well, in what, some people's it, minds. We know this. We see it. And this is why this, these capabilities are great. Another great technique that you can use if you're working in teams. Two elements of this. Everybody speaks once before anybody speaks twice. Right. You've got a group of eight of you in the room. Eight people have to speak before it comes back to you again. So everybody's getting an opportunity. And then you can add to that with leaders speak last. Yep, which is something that a lot of a lot of uh, successful Japanese companies yeah. practice is that the, the, the most senior person in the room speaks last. The most junior person in the room speaks first. Yeah. yeah it's not hard to do this, but it's like I said in the beginning. It's like dusting your house. Yeah. It, it's not enough to know that your house gets dusty. If you don't dust it every few days, the dust is going to build up. And it's the same thing with groupthink. If you don't use these simple techniques like you were just talking about, we have a lot more powerful techniques like oh, yeah. Devil's Troika, like uh, Premortem, like Assumptions Challenge that are designed to really take tackle groupthink head on. But even if you do, if you do these simple things that you're talking about, Marcus, it's a way of it's a way of preventing the group thing from building up. Let's give a great one now. I've just talked about people speaking, and even if your leaders in the room, you might not want to speak up. Anonymity, the capability to use anonymous techniques, whether you're using Mural, Miro, Jamboards, or as we often do in the room, a post-it note, a card. Just give everybody yeah. a post-it note and a pen. Write it all down shuffle the cards or put them all in a hat and someone draws them out. Nobody knows who said what. And then you're having great debate and discussion on topics that nobody's fearful of or nobody's that individual in the ASH experiment thinking that was mine and I did it wrong. Right. Everybody's just level, Ellie calls it, isn't it? Leveling the playing field. I love right. that phrase. And that's what you're doing. You're taking all the egos and passions and the, the power curve out of the room. And when you put eight different post-its up on the wall, no one knows who they came from. Absolutely. What, what's that, tell me that story about the general you did that one with, and the uh, the Pentagon. Oh, the, one of the first one of the first red teaming exercises yeah. that they did at the Pentagon. They ended up uh, coming up with with three different recommendations, and uh, for changing the U.S. the national military strategy, and it was all done anonymously, like you're talking about. And at the end of the week, the 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 three star and, and in the group there was everything from a, a two star lieutenant to a three star general, and everything in between. The, the commanding general said, you know, I, I know that we agreed to be anonymous, but but I'd like to at least know who the person was, who the people were, who came up with the three different uh, uh, recommendations that we all developed and, and have agreed to put forward because it wasn't me, he said. And cute <laughs> and, uh, it, it, it very sheepishly, this second lieutenant, you know, 24 year old, raised his hand and said, uh, Yes, sir. And, and the general said, which one Which one of these was yours, son? And he said, uh, all three, sir. And, uh, <laughs> and the general said to him, son, I'm not going to lie to you. You know, when we first met on Monday, if it was 1159 and my stomach was growling and you told me it was time for lunch, I told you, I would have told you you didn't know what the hell you were talking about. Yeah. But that anonymity allowed that, that young mm -hmm. officer's voice to be heard. We see that all the time in our work. Absolutely. Absolutely. So many good ways to do this. So many, so many great techniques. That's why you need to, to just push back against it. Avoid complacency. Practice, create that psychological safety artificially, if necessary, using anonymity like Marcus talked about. And, and, and ask these tough questions. And if you really want to avoid it, red team thinking. <laughs>